this is my 25th video which I am making for the benefit of the students. At this stage, I would like to thank all the subscribers and viewers for your constant encouragement and overwavering support to make videos on different subjects for the civil engineering students. Please keep supporting so that we can make many more videos for the educational purpose. At this stage, I would like to thank all my family members, my friends and my well-wishers at this stage. I would also express my sincere and special thanks to my son, Sri Harshit R, who has worked with me day and night and has edited all the videos and brought out in a very fantastic manner as your viewing in all the videos. Thank you very much. Welcome to the session on conjugate beam method where this is another method of finding out the slope and deflection of beams. The beams can be either a determinant beam or a statically indeterminant beam. Earlier sessions you have already observed how to find out the slope and deflection by momentary method, by double integration method, by Michaelis method and many more. So here let us try to understand how to find out the deflection of and slope by conjugate beam method. Now by definition this conjugate beam is it is a fictitious beam an imaginary beam which has the same length as the real beam but is supported in such a manner that when it is loaded with m by e i diagram of the real beam the shear and the bending moment at any section in the conjugate beam gives the slope and deflection for the corresponding section of the real beam. That is simple. Here in this case, we are going to imagine a, a beam, it is a virtual beam we call. The load will be acting on this virtual beam will be the area of M by E A diagram that has been developed by the real beam. So whatever you had observed in the earlier session in the momentary method whether it is problems on simply supported beam or cantilever beam we used to draw the bending m by ei diagram that m by ei diagram itself is the loading diagram load that will be acting on the conjugate beam and the shear force and bending moment at any section gives the slope and deflection at that section. Now let us try to understand all these things with the examples. Before going into that, let us try to understand the two theorems that have been developed by Moore. Almost it is same as the theorems that are there in the momentary method. Only the way of putting the words will be different. It is very simple. The first theorem is about how to find out the slope at any point corresponding to the real beam. The shear at any point on the conjugate beam is the slope of the real beam at that point. The shear force will get me the slope. How to get the shear force? It is a load that should be acting on the conjugate beam. So what is the load that will be acting? 
it is the m by a diagram is the load i am stressing this again and again so that there is no need to get confused at the same time you can very clearly understand the concept of finding out the slope and deflection by the conjugate b method by looking into the problems <coughs> let us take the second theorem it's about finding out the deflection at any point of the real beam by taking the moment of the m by e i diagram on the conjugate beam to know the deflection we need to calculate the moment at any point at that point or at that section in the conjugate beam this is the what the second theorem says first theorem is about finding out the slope with respect to the shear force second point the theorem says about finding out the deflection with respect to the moment at that section before going into the problems there are some support conditions are there which are nothing but imaginary uh, conditions that have been presented for the simply supported beam conjugate and continuous for the different end conditions so in this session i am going to talk with respect to the fixed end and the simply supported beams fixed at one end is nothing but the cantilever problems and the simply supported beam problems so at the free end of the real beam there exist always slopes and deflections let us see that how it exists let me take a cantilever beam subjected to the loading system this is the nature of bend of the beam that is called as elastic curve we know very well that the slope is zero at the support to a certain length after that it starts bending so it is zero at the support that is theta we call slope is zero at the same time there is no deflection at the support a therefore we say it doesn't exist it doesn't exist there is no slope no deflection but as you go to the free end as it is said earlier the shear force the slope exists you're going to draw a tangential line to the elastic curve the angle that is measured with respect to the original axis of the beam is the slope therefore we say that slope exists at the free end b in also i have will be getting the deflection where b shifts from b to b dash so the deflection has come into existence it will there up to certain length towards the support when it come very close to the support it becomes zero the slope and the deflection become zero that means to say it doesn't exist now let us try to understand this concept with respect to the conjugate beam method here in this method i want the slope and the deflection at the free end and then the conjugate beam method we are not going to speak with respect to the shear force and bending moment so to get that one we have to see that the fixed end should be released that is at the support a whatever it is being fixed should be released it is an imaginary beam we call it as a fixed beam also called as a virtual beam so it is free at the end a and it will be fixed at the b this is what the arrangement we are going to make so as it is said earlier wherever there is a support at that point there will be a shear force so for this imaginary beam the shear force and the reaction will exist at the support and that itself can be called as shear force so this shear force whatever you calculate with respect to the m by e diagram that will be acting on the conjugate beam will get me this value the load that will be acting here is not the real load that will be acting on the real beam this is the imaginary load that will be acting imaginary load is nothing but 
the area of M by EI diagram. Now you get we are getting the moment at this support and that moment whatever you calculate with respect to the imaginary load that will be acting will give you the deflection at B. We we'll try to understand this properly. If you understand this it becomes very easy and it will be very easy to understand once we start with the problem. So the becomes in the case of a conjugate beam the fixed end will be released it becomes free and the free end which was there at the fixed real beam will be the fixed end. This is what we are going to assume or imagine to get the slope and deflection at the free end. If you want anywhere in between A and B, there also you can calculate with the same concept. Now let us try to understand the case of simply supported beam. You will be having one support will be a inch, the other one will be the roller. These are the two supports we have got. So here, if I draw the tangential line to the elastic curve, that means that means to say that slope exists at support A and slope at exists at the support B. At both the points we got it. As you come towards the center, the slope can become zero. If you draw the tangential line, horizontal line here, it becomes horizontal line, horizontal. The tangential line will be horizontal here to the elastic curve. Therefore, it will be zero at the center of the beam. There will be no deflection at the supports. Don't find any <coughs> downward movement due to the loading system that will be given. Therefore, in the case of a real beam, we say that there exists the slopes at the supports and there we no deflection at the supports. It remains in the same position, static position. Now here we have to change, see that whether and for this one definitely you will be having the shear forces will be there. And in the case of a conjugate beam, Also, there will be a slope existing at support A and the slope existing at the support B and there will be no deflections also due to the imaginary loading system due to the M by E I diagram acting on the beam. Therefore, in the case of a simply supported beam, there is no need to change the support conditions. There is no need to change the support. You can, you can keep the same thing because theta exists means slope exists means that means there will be a shear force. Shear force will be there. Shear force is nothing but the reaction at the support. If I calculate the shear force or the reaction at the support that will get me the slope at that support. So the slope at A is then nothing but reaction at support A. Slope at B is the reaction at the support B. We will understand all these things in the problem. Now there is no moment here, any moment, since all the ends are in and with the rollers, there will be no moment, therefore there will be no deflection. Delta A and delta B is equal to 0 because the bending moment is 0 at the supports. So in the case of a conjugate beam, the support conditions remain same as that of the real beam. Whereas in the case of a cantilever problem, the free fixed end was made free end and the free end was made fixed end to get the shear force and deflections from the shear force and the bending moment we used to get the slope and deflection at that point. 
Now, sign convention is very important to solve the problem. We also expressed these things in the earlier session in momentary method. We will try to understand once again here. Now, the shear force will be considered positive if the left end of the section tends to move upward and a right hand tends to a right side of the section tends to move downward. Whenever you are solving the problem, either you will be solving the problem from right hand side or from the left hand side. If the upward force is acting to the left of the section, we take that as a positive shear force. If you are going to solve the problem from the right hand side, if the force is acting downward, that can be treated as positive. Similarly, if the right hand tends to move up with respect to the section consider, then or if the solve the problem from the left hand side, if the left hand tends to move downward, we consider the shear force at that section to be negative. In general, I can write like this xx will be the section. If you are solving the problem, if you consider the right hand side of the section, all fo shear force calculated with respect to the downward force is taken as positive and upward is taken as negative. If you are solving the problem from the left hand side, the forces that will be acting downward will be considered negative. The forces which will be acting upward will be considered positive. This is very important to be noted. And all these things you know uh, from your early semester in strength of materials. The same concept has been adopted over here. So it's easy to remember. Coming to the sign conventions for the bending moment. Moment due to every upward force, whether it is to the right of the section or to the left of the section, whether you solve the problem from right side or left side, the beam will try to bend in a concave position. It's concave upward, convex downward. Then we say that the bending moment is positive, or we consider it to be positive. We say that it is a sagging bending moment. So, moment due to every upward force, whether to the right of the section or to the left of the section, will create a sagging bending moment like this. Therefore, it is considered as positive bending moment. This will be erupting in all solving all the problems. So let us see if the forces are acting downward, whether it is to the right of the section or to the left of the section. It will create an auging moment like this, where it is convex upward, concave inward, downward. We consider this to be a negative bending moment. This is also we have studied in the bending moment shear force chapter in the earlier semester. Coming to the geometrical properties of different sections, the geometrical properties of the different M by E I diagram sections, I have explained in very detail in the moment area method. You can have a look on that video also, which will be very helpful. We are once again going to study about this shapes of the M by E I diagrams and the area or the position of the C G of this M by E I diagram from the left and the right end. So, first let me consider a cantilever beam subjected to a couple at the free end. We are going to get a rectangular M by E I diagram. The area of that is base into height. The x bar distance from the left hand will be b by 2. The x bar distance from the right hand will be b by 2. Now, for the can for same cantilever problem subject to a point load at the free end, you are going to get a triangular type of M by E I diagram. As I said earlier in my se earlier sessions, the bending moment diagram divided by E i is called as M by E i diagram. E i is the flexural rigidity, E is the Young's modulus, I is the moment in F inertia of the section. So, area of this is half into base into height. 
from the vertical end left hand side end it will be equal to b by 3 from the apex end from the right hand side it will be equal to 2b by 3. Uh, it has been reversed that is all we have changed the end A has been made free but end B is fixed same triangular formula triangular form area is half into base into height from this end it will be 2b by 3 and from the vertical end from the right end B it is b by 3. If it is a cantilever problem subjected to uniformly distributed load it is a parabolic curve where the area of this is calculated as one third of base into height and the central distance from the vertical end is b by 4 from the right end it is three fourth of that breadth b it's b by 4 it is 3 b 3 fourth of b you can look at this also if you consider a simply supported beam subjected to uniformly distributed load o s span l this will be the parabolic diagram a bending moment m by ei diagram we are going to consider the half of this part from the symmetry point of view. So, the area of that is half into sorry two third of this base width here from here to here it is designated as b into height. The central distance from the central of this one is 3 by 8 times of b and from the right hand side it is 5 by 8 times of b. We will just change the figure consider it from the left hand side that is all. You can observe it the CG position which is very important for calculation purpose from the left and right hand side. If you consider the simplest support beam subjected to an eccentric loading at a distance A from the left support and B from the right support the area of that is half into base is L into I. The CG from the left hand will be equal to L plus A by 3 and from the right hand it is L plus B by 3. If the load is acting exactly at the center, you are going to take only half of the portion from the center considering the symmetry of the diagram. Area is taken as half of the L by 2 into height and x bar distance from this vertical end will be equal to one third of L by 2 from the apex and right hand it is two third of L by 2. All these things we have studied in the first year engineering mechanics in the CG and MI chapter the same thing has been adopted here with respect to the M by diagram. So, geometrical properties of this triangle is being calculated here. If the cantilever beam is subjected to a wearing load, uniformly wearing load, that is triangular load, the bend M by E diagram will be cubic curve, a third degree curve. The area of this is calculated as one fourth of B into H. For parabolic, it we are going to take two third, that is one third we are going to consider. From the vertical end, it is taken as 1 by 5 times of B, whereas from the right hand, it is taken as 4 by 5 times of the B, horizontal width. These are the simple, simple different geometrical properties. Now, let us try to understand all these theorems the formulas that have been used or the Im imagination that we are supposed to make and from the geometrical properties of the uh, various m by e diagrams we can understand how to get the slope and deflection at any point. Now, let me take a simple problem a cantilever problem beam subjected to the concentrated W at the free end. As usual as we have done it in the momentary method here also we are going to calculate the m by ei values at different sections 
moment at B is 0, W into 0 is 0, moment at A is WL by 2. So once you calculate the M by EI values, plot the M by EI diagram by drawing the elastic curve and then the M by EI diagram. zero at n b and w l by e i at the fixed end. How to get the slope at b? We want the slope at b. According to the conjugate beam method concept, the fictitious beam, the imaginary beam, the end support end a which is fixed in the real beam has been made free in the conjugate beam and it has been fixed at the free end to get the shear force. So the first theorem says that the slope at any point is equal to the shear force at that point due to the M by EI diagram. That means for me to calculate the shear force, I need the load of this diagram, not this load. Remember it. This is the loading diagram. Calculate the reaction at A is nothing but the area of M by A diagram between A and B, which will be acting at the CG. This is the load A by EI. A by EI is nothing but this, and that is nothing but the slope at B. The reaction at B is the is the shear force at B due to this loading diagram. This load is nothing but the area of M by EI diagram. So consider this now. So what is the area of that M by E diagram? It is half into the base into height W L square by 2i minus sign we have used because it is a downward deflection and the it is clockwise in nature according to the earlier assumption that clockwise moments uh, rotations will be taken as negative. That is a slope. W L square by 2. Now let us calculate uh, the deflection at B. There is a deflection which has moved from this point to this point. I can say this is B and this one is B dash. Consider this moment at B. The moment if you calculate at the fixed end. Now it is an imaginary beam. For this imaginary beam there will be a moment at B. The support has been fixed. Now the loading diagram is nothing but M by E I diagram which will act at the distance two third of this length. The CG of this area will lie at a distance two third from the fixed end. Now calculate the moment of this M by EI diagram with respect to A by multiplying with 2 by 3 L. The distance from here to here will be taken into consideration that is A by EI is the load into distance will get me the moment. So it is minus WL square by 2 into 2 third of the distance. Negative sign will indicate that it is a downward deflection. Let us take another problem to determine the slope and deflection at the free end of the cantilever beam as shown in the figure. Now this is a cantilever problem given with a partial uniformly distributed load or a part length of 4 meters from the free end B. You have been given with the Young's modulus and the moment of inertia. Calculate, convert this EI values in terms of kiloton meter square which you are already used to this calculation. You are converting the megapascals into kilonewton per meter square, i into meter i, which is in terms of mm to the power of 4, to meter twice to the power of 4. So you will get the flexural rigidity EI value. Let's keep it there. Ready? As usual, calculate the moment of uh, m by EI calculations at different positions like B, C, A. And the ready moment at B is 0 no load. At C you will be having 20 into 4 into 4 by 
2, 20 into 4 is the point load. It will be acting at the center of its length. It's 2 meter, that is 4 by 2. Similarly, calculate the M by EI value just to the right of A. It's 20 into 4 acting at the center of its length, that is 4 by 2 plus 3 meter from support A. So get 400 by EI. Exactly at A, the moment can be the values to draw the diagram it can be made to equal to zero that means to say it is just to the left of A. So draw the elastic curve as well as the M by EI diagram. Now this is how it, the M by EI diagram comes for the uniformly distributed load it, which have got a second degree equation therefore it will be parabolic in nature after that it varies linearly with one degree x to the power of 1. We'll divide this into two parts, number of parts as you observe here. I am making this trapezium part into two triangles and this is taken separately, the parabolic part. Now we will calculate the slope at B. As per the first theorem, the statement of the first theorem, the shear force at the point B will be the slope at B. So go to draw a tangential line, it's a, a graphical method, right now we are not going to draw any graphics here. Therefore, we'll just draw a line and understand it. Now we'll calculate the conjugate shear force at B in the conjugate beam. So shear force at B is equal, slope at B is equal to shear force at B, slope at this point is equal to shear force. Shear force is nothing but the reaction at the support B in the conjugate beam. Now this problem has been completely analyzed by the conjugate beam. Conjugate beam is nothing but an imaginary beam as it was said earlier. So this imaginary beam will carry the load from the M by EI diagram. The area of the M by EI diagram will be the loads on the conjugate beam. For that loads, if you calculate the shear force or the reaction of the support B, you will get the slope at B for the free end of the real beam. So we will calculate the area of the first part called as A1 by EI, which will act at a distance 3 fourth of the this length. But if this is not necessary for the slope part. I am just showing the position where exactly it lies. We will use, make use of this to calculate the deflection. Now calculate the area of the second first part is one third of base into height. This is one third of base into height. Take the second part. It will act at a distance one third of from this vertical length plus the remaining length. That is one third of this three. CG will lie at to distance one third as you observed already in the geometrical properties plus I am taking from B this values will be useful for the calculation of deflection at B when you calculate the moment. Right now we will forget about that we will think about A1 by EI, A2 by EI, A2 by EI is half into base into height, half into base into height. Now take the third part this one. It will lie at a distance two-third from this corner plus the four meters. So this is A3 by EI. We'll get the area of that as half into the space is 400 into this altitude I can call it as height. It's three meter. We get the total area of, of all these things that will give you the shear force at B, the summation of all these vertical forces will give you the reaction at B and reaction at B is nothing but the shear force at B and shear force at B is equal to slope at B of the real beam. Okay, This value of EI has been given and it has been converted uh, equal to 116 to 10 to the power of 3 kiloton meter square. Divide by that you will get it as minus 6.58 in 10 power minus 3 radians. Convert this radius into 
degrees by multiplying by 180 degree dividing it by pi radians you'll get this angle of rotation gear which is clockwise in nature which was earlier treated as a negative with respect to the sign convention is 0 0.377 degree clockwise now let us calculate the deflection at the free end same diagram now the distances will come into picture there's a deflection at b that is ba measuring the deflection at b with respect to a that is the meaning of delta ba as it was explained in the moment area method session now what is deflection at b deflection at b is the moment of the area of m by a diagram about b between a and b of the fixious beam it should be at the fixious beam that is the conjugate beam here we don't have any moment here moment will exist only in the fixed end for the real beam by conjugate beam method we are changing the fixed end to free end and free end into fixed end we are going to calculate the moment due to the loading diagrams each part of the diagram m by a diagram so what is delta b that is a by ei which will be acting at a distance <coughs> 3 fourth of 4 then second one that is uh, 1 third into 4 into 160 by ei is the area that is the load that will be acting on the conjugate beam i am repeating this again and again so that you understand the theorem 1 and 2 properly we are solving the problem with respect to the conjugate beam in the conjugate beam the load will be the area of the m by d graph i will be repeating only in this particular problem after that we will just go and carry on with the problem so it is acting at a distance 3 fourth of the 4 meters length the second one the area of the second part which will act at a distance of one third from here but we want with respect to b therefore plus 4 has been added up the third area also to be taken there's a moment due to the second part third one area of this into its distance from B, two third of this three meters plus four meter is the distance from B. So take that moment into consideration. Add up all these individual moments with respect to B, we'll get the slope at B, sorry, deflection at B. Now you got the magnitude of five, four, four, zero by EI divided by the value of whatever your calculator the flexural rigidity divided by that you will get it as 0 0.034 meters convert that into mm by multiplying by 1000 and minus sign will indicate it as a downward deflection and moment due to every downward force we have taken negative therefore all this have been treated with negative sign as I said earlier for the sign conventions for the bending moment moment due to every downward force either to the right or to the left of the section it is considered to be negative moment due to every upward force will be taken as positive that we'll see that in the uh, simply supported problem now let us go into another problem now this problem it is a non-prismatic member where the span AC has been given with 2i and CB is being given with I value. It's a not prismatic member. The previous problem almost it was similar except this point load and the EI values different in different parts. So that was taken as a prismatic member and this is a non prismatic member. So let us understand how to solve this problem. The calculation of EI is very simple. In this case, E is given 2 into 10 power of 5 megapascals and I of 
5 into 10 to the power of 8 mm to the power of 4. So after conversion, we have got this flexural rigidity value EI equal to 100 into 10 to the power 3 kiloton meter square. We'll use this value later in the calculation of slope and deflection. Now, go with M by EI calculation. Moment at B is 0. Moment at C just to the right because the section is varying here. The same concept was adopted in the moment area method also. Wherever there is a change in the cross section of the member, that means where there is a change in the I value, there we have to take twice. So once to the just to the right of this C, taking I into consideration and next time taking just to the left of moment calculating just to the left of C by considering this 2I. Okay, the value of just to the right of C, bending moment at just to the right of C is 20 into 2 acting at a distance 2 by 2. This divided by 1 EI will get by 40 by EI as the bending moment just to the right of C. Now let us calculate just to the left of C by taking this 2i, the same value 20 into 2 into 2 by 2. Moment due to this is 0 because 60 into this distance is 0. Therefore we are not taking the 60 here into consideration. And this value just to the left of C is divided by 2EI. Therefore we get the value just to the left of moment just to the left of C as 20 by EI. Calculate moment just to the right of A. Then we are going to take this 20 into 16 into consideration. So it is 20 into 2 acting at the center of its length that is 2 by 2 plus 2 meters. 2 by 2 plus 2 meters. Along with this you have been taking into consideration the moment due to this point load, vertical load, vertical point load that is 60 into 2. This divided by the value 2i. So we are going to divide this by 2i. The final product is 120 by ei. Moment just to the left of a is 0. Now for this values whatever we have calculated the m by ei values. Draw the m by ei diagram. First let us draw the elastic curve as usual. There is a nature of bending of the elastic uh, sorry beam. The bending is called as an elastic curve. Draw the m by ei diagram. So moment at B it was 0, moment at just to the right of C is 40 by EI, moment just to the left of this is 20i that means take a vertical drop here. So whenever the cross section changes the bending M by EI diagram there will be a vertical drop either rise or fall, you can find it here. Then afterwards a value of 120 has been joined, to that it has been joined. So let us divide this into a number of parts as usual. This is how we are going to divide it. Now get the slope at, now in this question the slope and deflection at B and C has to be calculated. B also we should calculate, C also we will calculate. We understand this, then it is easy to solve any problem. You can look into my notes that has been attached, the link has been given in the <coughs> YouTube so that you can have a look on other problems and learn more. Now let us calculate the slope at B. Draw a tangential line at B. I want the slope here. For that we need the conjugate beam because there we get the shear force. Slope at B is nothing but the shear force in the conjugate beam and that is nothing but the reaction at B. So how to get reaction? It is the summation of the loads that will be acting to the left of this section B. So what is the load there? It is nothing but the areas of M by EI diagram will be the load that will be acting on this virtual beam which is called as conjugate beam. Now take the first area 
one third of this distance into i40, one third of 2 into 40 by ei, that's the area of this parabolic curve. Take the second one, which will act at a distance, one third of this distance plus 2 meter. As I said earlier in the previous problem, all these values are useful for the bending moment calculation at P. Right now, I am showing just the position where exactly it lies for the third one. Calculate the area. These are the loads A1 by EI, A2 by EI, A3 by EI are the loads in the conjugate beam. This summation of this loads will get me the shear force at B. That is what you are doing here. So just add up all the things, we will get the slope at B, that is 1 minus 167.61 by EI, divide this value by EI, we will get the answers in terms of radians, convert that radians into degrees by multiply by 180 degree, divide by pi, you will get as 0 0.095 degree clockwise direction, the minus sign will indicate it as a clockwise rotation. Now let us calculate the slope at C. I'll draw the same elastic curve. The same diagram remains there. Make use of the calculation. See the slope that has to be calculated at C. Slope at C is nothing but shear force at C. So we will draw the uh, line here, a section line. Let me calculate the shear force at this point C by drawing a line here. So what will be the force between this? It is the area of M by diagram between a and C and that is the load that we are going to consider, area of M by diagram between A and C for the slope at C. So look at the diagram now, it is only this part, this we have neglected it. So it is between A and C we are going to talk about to get the slope at C. So area of this, you calculate, this are shown with respect to this one, nothing to do here as I said earlier. It's a position I mark. I want A2 by EI, which is nothing but half into base into height, half into this is the base into height. Now get the area of the second diagram here. I call this A3. This A1 I've neglected here, not consider for the slope at P. So it is minus half into this base into this height. It's 120 by 2, totally you get my, the final answer as minus 140 by EI. We'll get it in terms of radians as minus 1.4 into 10 to the power of minus 3 radians. Multiply that by 180, divide by pi so that this radians is converted into degrees. You've got a clockwise moment of, uh, sorry, clockwise rotation of 0 0.0802 degrees and this is the slope. Now let us calculate the deflections at B and C. The deflection at B is from here to here, it is deflected. I could have marked this as B and B dash. So it is nothing but moment in the conjugate beam at B. So that means we need the loads on the conjugate beam. Loads on the conjugate beam are A1 by EI, A2 by EI, A3 by EI, calculate all those things. The area into Distance will get me the moment, this is the area we are calculating, it is equal to half in one third into 2 into 40 by EI, acting at 3 fourth of 2. Similarly get the sec area of the second part we have consider. Note on the distance, it is one third from here, plus 2 meter will get me the distance from B get that. Half into base into height into its distance from B. Moment about B. The third part. Get the moment of that. Half into base into height. Acting at two third of two plus two meter. From here to here two third plus two meter. Get the final product and it is minus 493.33 by EI, divide this by EI value of equal to 100 into 10 to the power of 3 kiloton meter square, 
you get as 4.93 10 power minus 3 meters multiply this by 1000 you'll get it in mm because the final deflection at b is 4.93 mm so minus n will indicate it is a downward deflection you're coming down similarly get the deflection at c deflection at c so for this you are going to consider the moment of the area of m by ei diagram between a and c so this part has been neglected and you follow the same procedure to solve the other problems which are there in the notes go through that you will understand better so draw the deflection we'll get the deflection here as I said earlier, it is the moment of the area of M by EI diagram between A and C about C. Consider a section here at C. I want to get the moment at this point, moment C. So I need the loads here on the conjugate beam and the loads are from the M by EI diagram. So take this, which will act at a distance one third of this two meters. got the area of the first one and its distance from C. Now the area of second one half into base into height as already know that it's half into base into height. It's acting at a distance two third from C. Multiply that, get me the final answer and it is minus 173.33 by EI. So once you divide by EI value you're going to get the Final deflection as 1.73 mm downward. The deflection here it is 1.73, early it was 4.73 or something like that. So this completes the calculation of slope and deflection at any point or at the free end. Anywhere along the length of the beam you can calculate and these are the procedures you can adopt. Well, thank you for watching the video. If you like it, comment it. If you are not subscribed till now, kindly subscribe. Thank you very much.